Welcome to this online lesson on the Revolt of the Earls of 1075. The aim is to know the causes, events and consequences of the Revolt of the Earls of 1075. So far, the revolts we've looked at against William's rule have all been from the Anglo-Saxons. This one's different. Although there's a Saxon involved, actually the leading players are Normans, and that makes it rather different. So here's a do now task. Today, most people marry because they love somebody, or at least they should do. But in the Middle Ages, for the nobility, this was different. How and why? Consider that question and pause the video while you note down your response. Well, the fact of the matter was, marriage was a matter of wealth, privilege, and indeed influence in the Middle Ages. People married for political reasons, either to draw an alliance with another important family, or indeed, in the case of royalty, to make alliances with other countries. As it happens, the wedding that is concerned with this particular revolt was also an ideal chance for some nobility to meet up at a time when communication was incredibly difficult, especially private communication that would have been face to face. The plot unfolds at a wedding. Let's consider the bride first of all. Emma Fitzosborne. She was the daughter of King William's oldest friend, William Fitzosborne, who was a Norman. I'm afraid that's about all we're going to have to say about Emma tonight. Although it's likely that she's played some role in the defence of, uh, of uh, her husband Ralph de Gale's castle later on in the rebellion, her role is not particularly well recorded, as is unfortunately common for women of this period. So, Sommer, Emma, it's nothing personal. I'm afraid the sexism of the time just means we don't know too much about you. Let's consider the men who I'm afraid we do know so much more about. Firstly, the bride's brother, Roger de Bretoy. Roger de Bretoy was Earl of Hereford. Now that's significant. Hereford was on the border with Wales and therefore was one of the Marcher Earldoms. He was the son of, of William Fitzosborne and the Earl of the Marcher Earldom of Hereford with, an additional, with additional powers. William had given him less land and power than his father had enjoyed, however. What about Emma's new husband, Ralph de Gale? Ralph de Gale was the Earl of East Anglia and another Norman. Ralph grew up in Brittany and was the son of an Anglo-Norman. Again, Ralph's land and power was reduced compared to his father's holdings. And lastly, their honoured guest, the Earl Waltheof. Earl Waltheof was Earl of Northumbria and a Saxon. He's the only Saxon plotter and the last Saxon Earl in England. He had rebelled twice before, but had been pardoned by William as a gesture of Norman reconciliation after the Harring of the North. Maybe William realised that he went a bit far. Your tasks then. Again, sorry Emma. Record the names and some of the key facts about each of the conspirators. Explain why each might have wanted to rebel. And thirdly, which plotter do you think had most reason to rebel? Explain your choice. Pause the video while you complete that. Okay, so Roger de Bretoy might have wanted to rebel because the, the additional powers that he enjoyed as a marcher earl were being eroded by William. Similarly, Ralph de Gale, although he had previously been very loyal to William, was losing land and influence, and perhaps this upset him. We don't know quite for sure. Waltheof is perhaps more obvious. As the last Anglo-Saxon earl, he may have harboured some, still some resentment towards the Norman occupation. So who had the most reason to rebel? Well, I'll leave that up to you. But they all had their reasons, and I'm sure you've explained your reasoning. Why rebel in the first place? We're going to consider this in the form of a mind map. You'll probably want to create one of your own. Each of these pictures represents a reason why the earls rebelled. What might they be? Remember that effective mind maps often include illustrations to make them more memorable. Firstly, the loss of lands. The land holdings of the earls have been reduced with land given to the king. Then we have loss of privileges. The martyr earls, like the de Bretoy, had enjoyed privileges including castle building and tax raising. These had been reduced. Also, there's the loss of power. The combined loss of land and privileges have resulted in a loss of power too. Also, Wolfioff may have resented being the only Anglo-Saxon Earl left. But what about William? Well, this provided an opportunity. William was away in Normandy, as he was for about 80% of his reign. His regent, Lanfranc, who was Archbishop of Canterbury, could act on his behalf in almost the same way as the King, but it was expected that he would be slow to react and unsure as to how much authority he had. Also, the plotters had powerful allies. They had secured help from the Danes, and it was hoped that this would lead to Norman responses being split and weakened. If William had to deal with, deal with a Danish invasion at the same time as fighting with the Earls, then it would be more difficult for him to win. Lastly, the, the plotters were uh, counting on Anglo-Saxon rebelliousness. 
It was expected that the Saxons would rise up against William, as they had done between 1068 and 1071. So your tasks. Create your own mind map based upon this one. Explain how each factor led to the revolt. As an extension, what appear to be the risks of rebelling? Pause the video now while you complete that. Okay, so what are the risks? Well, first of all, if they lose out, then their loss of lands and privileges and power are only going to get worse. In fact, they'd likely either be executed or lose everything. What about the opportunities? Well, William was away, but really they were counting on Lanfranc not being an effective regent. So quite a gamble. And also powerful allies. Yes, the Danes are yet again being called upon, but may I remind you that they were also called upon in the, the rebellions of 1068 and 71 and actually failed to help. And what about Saxon rebelliousness? Let's not forget that the Saxons were very tired of Norman uh, brutality by this point. Were they really going to rise up against the Normans when they had seen what had happened to people who rose up against William? Well, let's consider now what really happened. Here's the plan. The plan for the plot was simple, but not especially realistic. They were to raise armies in their earldoms and unite to overthrow William's rule. They would strike while William was in Normandy, leaving his regent, Lanfranc, in charge. And they would rely on Anglo-Saxon support for extra strength. They would also get support from Canute, who was the son of King Swain of Denmark. They would divide the kingdom into three and share it between themselves, each ruling effectively as king. Your task then. Summarise the plan in a paragraph or two. Which elements of the plan rely on assumptions? In other words, they're assuming that something will happen. And thirdly, explain one part of the plan that seems likely to help them succeed. Lastly, how likely is the plan to succeed overall? Pause the video now while you consider those questions. OK, hopefully we've been able to summarise that plan. So which rely on assumptions? Well, there is an assumption that Lanfranc isn't going to be any good at his job. There's also an assumption that Canute is really going to help the, uh, the, the rebellion. And also there's the assumption that the Anglo-Saxons actually are going to rise up in support of them. So which part of the plan is likely to succeed? Well, they are likely to raise their armies. After all, these are nobles who are in charge of their forces and really they're going to be calling the shots. But how likely is the plan to succeed overall? Well, I've got particular doubts, especially about the last one. Even if they do succeed, how likely is it that they're going to be able to divide up the, the kingdom into three peacefully? Isn't this just a recipe for further fighting between the three of them? All of this is basically immaterial because the revolt failed. I've included a link in the description of this video to a video which helps you to understand what happened. I urge you to watch this and then attempt the following questions. Which country did rebels hope to get support from and did they? How did they hope that they'd catch King William out? How did Archbishop Lanfranc know what was happening? How did Lanfranc respond? And as an extension, the revolt failed. If you were William, how would you deal with the three, three plotters? I urge you to watch the video now, so you can pause this one, check out the link in the description, and then have a go at answering these questions. Okay, so what did we find out? Which country did the rebels hope to get support from, and did they? Well, they planned to get support from the Danish fleet, in other words, Denmark, led by Canute, son of King Swain of Denmark. They arrived late, saw the revolt was failing, raided the coast, and left. Very helpful, I don't think. How did they hope that they'd catch King William out? Well, William was not in England, he was in Normandy. This meant he would find out later and be slow to react. It was a perfect time for a revolt in England. How did Archbishop Lanfranc know what was going on? Well, Earl Wolfioff switched sides and gave the plan away to Lanfranc, who was ruling as regent on William's behalf. This allowed Lanfranc to respond quickly before William returned to England. So how did Lanfranc respond? Lanfranc acted decisively. That question as to whether he was any good at his job was soon answered. Saxon support never materialised. It's possible that they were still terrified by the memory of the Harring of the North, and the Earls were quickly defeated by the army raised by Lanfranc. By the time William arrived, the revolt was almost over. So how would you deal with those three potters? Perhaps you'd think, well, enough's enough, I'm going to kill the lot of them. Well, Norman politics was rarely that simple. These men also had powerful friends. Simply killing everyone was often a, a likely cause of further revolts rather than serving them. Solving them, rather. What happened to the plotters? Your tasks are to record the fate of each conspirator, and then consider this. 
Would you describe William's response as A, lenient, in other words, he was quite easy on them, or B, harsh? Explain your point of view. First, Roger de Bretagne, Earl of Hereford. Roger was captured. Much like he had done to Morcar a few years before, William imprisoned him for life. But he did not execute him. Was William getting soft in middle age, maybe? Next, Ralph de Gale, Earl of East Anglia. Ralph fled back to Brittany. His wife was already there. William besieged his castle at Dol. Initially, it seems that his wife, Emma, might have actually started the defence here, but it's not particularly clear. But eventually, although besieged, William had to withdraw from the castle. Although Ralph was exiled and was never allowed to return to England again, and he lost all of his titles, and he was basically a wanted man, he more or less otherwise got away with it. Lucky old Ralph. And what about Waltheof, Earl of Northumbria? Surely, as he switched sides and was actually very loyal in the end, and gave the, the plot away, he must have survived. No, don't count on it. Waltheof fled, but William tempted him home with an offer of leniency. And he would have expected to have been pardoned again, as he had done before. After all, he had fatally betrayed the plot to Lanfranc. However, this being his third rebellion, William had lost patience with him. He was executed. So, answer those final questions. And once you've done that, that will be the end of the lesson, and I'll say thank you for watching. It's been quite a quick one, but I hope it's been interesting. If it has been interesting and useful, please click the like button and subscribe to the channel for even more. Thank you very much and goodbye.